You're listening to the St. John's Diamond Creek Podcast. This episode presented by Associate Minister Joel Snibson. This Bible reading is from Matthew 20, verses 1 to 16. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them to his vineyard. About nine in the morning, he went out and saw the others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard. I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because nobody hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owners of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the workers and, and pay them for their wages, beginning with the last one hires, hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each re- received a denarius. So when those who came who were hired first, they expected to receive more, but each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grum- grumble to the landowner. These who hired last only work for one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of work in the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I am not being unfair to you, friend. Did you, didn't you agree to go work for Denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do that, to do what I want to do with my own money, or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. So how strong is your sense of fairness? If you've studied, I'm guessing you may have experienced the group project. For those who have a visceral response to the idea of a group project, why is it? When I was at uni during a group project, someone in my group message saying, sorry, can't make it, family emergency has come up. For me to then see photos on Facebook of them out partying with friends meant I had steam coming out of my ears. The feeling when you've done the brunt of the work, others do nothing and you equally share the same grade. If it's a high grade, you're bitter that they didn't deserve it. If it's a lower grade, feeling salty that they pulled you down by not fairly contributing. Or imagine you worked at a startup and you helped get the company off the ground and with all the excitement, you overlooked a low salary and worked hard to develop systems in your department. You often stayed late. But now the company has grown and you finally are paid and recognised for the work that you've done. But with new staff coming on board with zero experience, you discover that they are also getting paid at your new salary when you were getting peanuts. How do you feel? Well, as Australians, we have a high view of fairness and it's often front and centre in the workplace. We expect fair pay and recognition for our work. Right now, the federal government is introducing legislation to prevent wage theft theft, so lower paid workers aren't being ripped off. And while many of us love the convenience of delivery services like DoorDash and Uber Eats, the government is looking to close loopholes to ensure drivers get minimum rights like everybody else because of fairness. Well, today we begin a series in Matthew called Stories of the Kingdom, where we encounter Jesus' parables that challenge us about what God's kingdom is like. And in verse 1, Jesus describes the kingdom of heaven like a landowner hiring workers for his vineyard. But when they got paid, some cried, unfair. 
See, Jesus' parable isn't a commentary on workplace relations, but it goes deeper to God's scandalous grace that confronts our ideas of fairness. Well, this vineyard is full of ripe grapes. It's late September, this time of year, and it's still hot. And all the grapes needed to be picked all at once. So we've got this narrow window to do this big job. So early in the morning, just before 6 a.m., the landowner goes out to the market to hire workers. Just picture movies set in the Depression or in the Industrial Revolution, the scene of desperate workers waiting outside factories, all competing and hoping to get picked. In Jesus' day, labourers were unskilled and work was very insecure. It was day by day or even less. And with no unions or fair work protections, employment was completely at the whim of the owner. Well, so around 6 a.m., the landowner picked some workers and he agreed to pay them a denarius, which was actually the wage for a soldier, so this was generous for a labourer. But as the day goes on, with so many grapes needing to be picked, the landowner keeps on going back to the market to employ more workers. You can see a table on the screen. At 9 a.m., then at noon, then at 3 p.m. and even 5 p.m. with the work finishing at sunset at 6 p.m. So on this day, the first workers worked 12 hours, others nine hours, some six, others three, and some only worked one hour. Clearly, they didn't do equal shifts. In verse 8, the owner asking the foreman to pay the workers at the end of the day was actually significant. There are strict Old Testament laws in Leviticus 19 protecting the poorest of workers, requiring them to be paid at the end of the day, pretty much so they could eat. And things got interesting. In verse 9, the workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So those who only worked one hour got paid first and got paid their great amount for those working 12 hours, not a pro rata amount. So that when those who worked 12 hours saw those who only worked one hour getting a denarius, they got all excited expecting to cash in but they received the same amount, a denarius. What? No matter if they worked an exhausting 12 hours or just one measly hour, they'll paid the same. And in verse 11, when they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner, not happy. So what was the worker's complaint? Well, in verse 12, on the surface, their cry of unfair seemed valid. They compared the time spent working and their conditions. Those starting at 5 p.m. did very little work in the cool of the evening compared to those who did the brunt of the work under the hottest sun. But see the owner's response in verse 13. I'm not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? To be clear, this was not wage theft or some injustice. The landowner paid them immediately the great amount and a generous rate, and he fulfilled God's requirements preventing exploitation. Their outrage wasn't about their rights, but envy about the generosity towards those who didn't do much. And the heart of their complaint was in verse 12, and you have made them equal to us. What was outrageous was lifting the slackers up to their level. And this equalization of pay despite their different contributions was outrageous. Like the worker in the startup or in my group project, they just couldn't stand to see these last minute blow-ins getting recognized as the same. See, if our identity is in our hard work, We can be happy for others to receive generosity, but to a point. 
And it can be confronting seeing others receiving the grace all the way up to our level if we feel we've worked for it and deserve it. See, the owner names this heart issue in verse 15. Are you envious because I'm generous? See, in God's kingdom, God's grace is scandalous. For those who worked only one hour, they didn't somehow struck some amazing bargain. In verse 14, simply, I want to give. This owner gladly and generously and freely gave purely out of kindness to these undeserving workers. In verse 6, the owner asks those who are still there at 5 p.m., why have you been standing around here all day long doing nothing? Sounds a bit judgy, but it's actually not. And their response in verse 7 is key because no one has hired us. In school, I wasn't very sporty, so being picked for a team game would kind of be anxiety provoking and, you know, the embarrassment of being overlooked for the more athletic or desired people. See, at this market, by 5 p.m., these were the people who had been overlooked since 6 a.m., possibly four times by this owner choosing the cream of the crop, the fitter and the faster ones. Those overlooked were likely the oldest, weakest, had a disability, the least productive of the workers, and therefore the poorest. And by 5 p.m., their families were at risk of not eating that night. Don't miss the incredible kindness of the landowner. Sure, more grapes still needed picking, but these guys weren't going to do much. This owner is big-hearted and compassionate to the poor and gracious, but not our idea of fair. And God is like this towards us. While every good gift in life is God's generosity, this vineyard is a picture of salvation and what we receive through the gospel. Those who've just worked one hour, almost everything they got paid was not earned. Likewise, our privilege of knowing God, being part of his vineyard, is 100% because of Jesus' work. Last week, Tim spoke about grace. See, on the cross, Jesus labored in our place, exhausted to the point of death, and gloriously rose again to give us the gift of grace we could never earn. For us to receive this grace was completely unfair. Jesus, the perfect one, mercifully took the wages that we deserve, the wages of sin and death. And the scandal of grace means that we receive what we don't deserve, forgiveness of sins, friendship with God, enjoying playing our part in God's vineyard for all eternity. Grace is unfair. See, saving grace levels and equalizes all who trust in Jesus. We are all undeserving and the ground under the cross is flat. And this is outrageous according to our ideas of fairness because what we offer doesn't count at all. And in verse 16, Jesus describes this leveling. So the last will be first and the first will will be last. Well, as Jesus was on the cross, consider two people. Firstly, one of Jesus' disciples. During Jesus' ministry, they often got Jesus wrong, but the disciples had a close friendship with Jesus, and after he ascended into heaven, they continued for years to boldly proclaim Jesus, risking persecution, Some, like Peter, were martyred for Jesus. But also next to Jesus, on a cross, was a thief. He was sinful all his life. And unlike Jesus, he deserved to be up there. And in his final moment, he turned to Jesus in repentance and thankfulness. But he had no time to live differently. And both the martyred disciple and this criminal received the same scandalous grace. 
And Jesus both enjoy God's presence to the full and will receive the crown of life. And from our perspective, this can feel unfair. But from God's perspective, the difference between the most holy Christ-like Christian and the most disobedient believer is nothing compared to all of us in relation to our holy God. As the owner says to the complaining workers, this isn't unfair. God is the standard of justice and fairness. God always acts justly and without partiality. And God's fairness is always beyond our ideas. And he doesn't need to answer us about his kindness shown towards his children. But do you relate to the complaints of the worker who slogged all day? God's grace confronts our instincts about performance See, in my group project, why was smoke coming out of my ears? Well, I didn't know the person's circumstances, but ultimately I wanted the recognition and glory for the work that I've done, and I felt that this group member wasn't entitled to it. I was jealous about them receiving any unfair recognition and rewards benefiting from our hard work. See, our sinful hearts can be jealous of God's glory. We're also living in a individualistic culture where on social media, in our studies, work, the whole trajectory of our lives is yelling at us to prove yourself, achieve your dreams, effectively save yourself. So we strive in our career through relationships, sport or in finances. And Jesus says, be completely reliant on his grace. The world says, do more. Jesus says, it's done. See, God's economy isn't a transaction or of fixed rewards for time served. We can't claim God's gift like a right. And while grace compels us to thankfully serve, often sin causes us to lose sight of God's generous grace and we can credit any transformation or faithfulness to our efforts when it's all by God's grace. Isaiah 64, 6 says this, it says, All our righteous acts are like filthy rags. See, doing all the religious stuff outside of grace is completely offensive to God. It's wonderful that so many in our church family have been Christians spanning decades, some families in multiple generations generations worshipping the Lord Jesus. This is God's grace. You are not wasting your lives living for things of this world. But a Christian heritage comes with risks of having the attitudes of the workers in the vineyard the longest. We can faithfully serve and attend and contribute, but if we ever take our eye off God's generosity and grace in Jesus, we miss everything. And Jesus' parable shows that time clogged up serving means nothing in our standing before God. We can never earn God's grace or deserve it. Don't get me wrong. How we live certainly matters to God and grace ought to compel us to serve God with thankfulness, to be transformed by the Spirit. But in this parable, Jesus describes God's saving grace. Elsewhere in the Bible is about how Jesus will judge and allocate rewards based on our faithfulness in serving him in our lives. But like the workers selected first, focusing on our works leads to envy, while focusing on grace leads to joy for others. The scandal of grace for the undeserving should make us celebrate. So how can we celebrate God's grace to others? Well, firstly, keep our eye on mission. Notice how the owner was constantly going back to the market five times, searching for new workers to join his harvest. 
Our God is a pursuing God who is always on mission and calling broken people to himself. God is in the business of drawing the most unlikely and surprising people to encounter his grace in Jesus. That's why our vision is to know Jesus and make him known. Let's never expect otherwise. Let us never be comfortable in a nice Christian bubble, but may we always be generously welcoming seekers and skeptics, friends who are indifferent to our community of grace. And as new believers join Jesus' vineyard just as they are in all their mess, let's be encouraged that our gracious God is bringing in new workers just like us. See, sadly, the workers selected at 6am, their focus wasn't on the owner's generosity, but jealousy comparing themselves with those who work just one hour. So learning from the workers, secondly, Let's avoid the trap of comparison. On this vineyard, kingdom work is equally valued by God, but it's not an equal contribution. We all serve with different gifts and we all have different capacities and abilities to serve. But comparison is a trap that robs our joy, undermines our relationships and stops us serving from grace. Picture you're someone serving in a church ministry area for a long time and a new person starts serving in your role. Honestly, would this make you feel joyful or threatened? If honestly threatened, it's because like those on the vineyard, others have become the measuring stick. When we compare, we either consider ourselves pretty amazing and fall into pride Or we think everyone else is doing so much better and we fall into despair and both responses are sinful. And because of the trap of the comparison, the mindset of the workers is that we have to earn our acceptance before God and we completely miss God's grace in each other's lives. Let's rejoice in the generous, gracious God who equally saves the crucified thief and the martyred disciple. And like the complaining workers, there are people who we think are not worthy of God's generous grace. Could we rejoice in Jesus' gift for a convicted pedophile, a white supremacist at the January 6th riots, leaders in a genocide, Putin? Sure, these are hypotheticals. But how about persons who have caused you so much grief in your life, receiving the scandal of grace? While we should pray for justice and that God punishes evil, but if we deem some of being unworthy brought up to our level of grace, do we see our unworthiness of this free gift? See, in the vineyard, the workers uh, falling for comparison miss the big-hearted generosity of the owner. See, God's levelling grace acknowledges that not all starting points are equal. Those who worked all day only cared about the hours worked. But God's fairness is so much higher. See, those not selected all day had no purpose. They were weaker, poorer, and they were desperately reliant on the kindness of the owner. Meanwhile, those on the vineyard all day enjoyed purpose and relationship with the owner and the guarantee of a wage and food for the family. I heard of a guest preacher who was from a well-off area and was visiting a church that was in a more disadvantaged area who the church was really engaging with their community. And the preacher came up to this local pastor all upset because there was a bunch of young people smoking out the front. And he was all flustered and asking, what kind of discipleship happens here? And the local pastor simply asked, what were they smoking? He's like, what? What do you mean, what are they smoking? 
He was joyful because it was cigarettes, because some of them were coming off really hard drugs and were from tragic backgrounds. And sure, smoking isn't healthy, but this was a moment to rejoice in God's grace, not grumble. God's grace finds us in all different places. See, a big question facing the unfairness of grace is to think, oh, well, I'll just put in the minimum with my faith. Metaphorically, I'll serve just one hour and God's grace will make up the rest. And the Bible clearly warns against this cheap grace. And it also means that we miss out. In a previous job, I became friends with my supervisor and the way I related to him massively shifted over time. Initially, we were professional. Um, At times, I advocated for myself. We were transactional without much relationship. But over time, as we became friends, as we socialized outside of work, I didn't have to ask for things because I could trust that he was fair and looking after us. At times, I chose to do him a favor because our relationship shifted from transaction to friendship. His scandalous grace is all about relationship. Today, I've asked you, do you relate to the complaint of the worker who's been laboring all day? If you do, Notice in verse 13 that he calls them friends. This is a small detail, but significant as we finish. Those selected first, working all day, not only secured a generous wage, but they were serving in the vineyard and had access to know the owner. This was never meant to be only about business, but about friendship with the owner. And it was in the context of relationship that when he showed generosity to those other workers who really needed it, it was meant to be celebrated. Friends, through what Jesus has achieved by grace, opening the way of relationship with our holy God, one who seeks to know us and love us and call us friends for eternity, it's only through this friendship with Christ, that keeps our eyes on mission, that we would avoid the traps of comparison and acknowledge that not everyone's starting points are equal. But this relationship requires us to all personally experience and keep coming back to the reality that we are all just like those workers chosen at 5 p.m. We are all poor, helpless, weak, absolutely undeserving, and we could never earn what Jesus has generously given us. We are completely and desperately in need of this scandal of grace. It's unfair and levels us all. Amen. Thanks for joining us. If you'd like to subscribe to this podcast, you can do so in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts from. Just search for St. John's Diamond Creek.